three thirty now, three thirty sharp, of course. Okay. As a Swiss okay. webinar, we're always on time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So I'm pleased to welcome you to this first set of webinars uh, of the Luxury Venture Group. A big thank you to founder Dipendra Pandey for the organization and also for inviting me to host these two sessions of this afternoon. We already did one session earlier on this afternoon, which uh, went very well. It's interesting and super fun to have these new digital opportunities. As I hear, we have an audience today of 193 viewers from 27 different countries. A big welcome to our audience. And 63% of our audience are startups. And then we have many leaders, business leaders from different uh, luxury, uh, luxury, uh, luxury regions. So two sentences first on the Luxury Venture Group for those who do not know it. LVG was founded last year and is the creator of a global venture capital platform and startup ecosystem for luxury and related industries. LVG is Swiss-based and acts as an accelerator which scouts, selects and invests in startups from luxury and related industries. So this second webinar this afternoon focuses on the industries, art and culture, travel, media and lifestyle. What everybody really wants to know at the moment is what will the new idea of luxury be? For sure, this is going to be changing. How is everybody coping? What new ideas and opportunities are evolving? And what will happen in the future? So I am very pleased to welcome our three panelists here. We have Patrick Candrian, the Director of Gastronomy of the SV Group in Switzerland, which is the Innovative Gastronomy and Hotel Management Group. We have Deandra Donecker joining us from Berlin, Managing Director and Partner at Griesebach Auctions. And we have Victor Gisler, founder of May 36 Gallery in Zurich. So a big welcome to all of you. Welcome. Thank you for joining. Welcome. Thank you. And so let's start uh, with you, Patrick. Uh, what is the situation in your industry at the moment, the gastronomy? I think it's quite a challenge for you now. Um, thank you, Michelle, and uh, hello to everybody. Um, uh, special thank you also to Dipendra for organizing this panel. I'm happy to give you a little bit an overview of what our industry is like in these difficult times. Um, uh, representing uh, and the SV Group, uh, we are one of the largest uh, restaurant and hotel operator in Switzerland, also operating in Germany and Austria. And um, looking at the last, looking back at the four last weeks and um, the last 30 days, we see that travel has gone down by about 90%, hotels and restaurants somewhere between 80 and 85%. We operate um, food and beverage facilities in stadiums. Of course, the stadiums are closed. There are no soccer games. There are no rock concerts. There's nothing like that. So these businesses are, are just closed. So we're facing um, in our nearly 700 operations a very difficult, difficult situation. And, um, and when I look at uh, not only our industry, but uh, dig a bit deeper into our group, I must say we have um, about one quarter that is still partly open and these are mainly um, care facilities care facilities in Germany and Austria um, where we expected that um, expect that we would have much more to do in the coming days um, but the peak never actually um, went as, as bad as, as expected so even these care operations are having a, a difficult time so um, how do we how do we cope with this, the situation um, we tend to look at it in, um, in uh, five ways. We call it the five R's, and it's not the concept I or my colleagues developed. It's a concept we actually got um, from uh, um, McKinsey. And, and the first one is, is the, the first of these five R's is actually resolving uh, the situation we're in, actually navigating, navigating the storm we're in. Um, what's the current situation? How can we uh, reduce our costs by closing operations, um, by making sure that we 
um, talk to our customers, talk to our business partners, they have the same questions. They're in the same situation, not knowing what's going on, uh, not knowing what's going to come next. And so while we close down, while we cut costs, we um, have the luxury in all three countries that we can actually send our staff members to a so-called short time um, working program. That means we're not going to lay anybody off, but while they're not working, they get 80% of their salary and the government, the state supports that, subsidizes that. So once we open back our operations, we have our staff members and we stay in touch with them. They don't have to file for unemployment. And that's a very helpful situation, not only for our business, but for many other restaurant operators, hotel operators, um, luxury resorts um, in Switzerland, but also in Austria and in Germany to cope better with um, the lack of revenue and, and the costs that are not, of course, not disappearing from one day to the other. Um, so while we, while we um, talk to our customers trying to figure out what do they need and how can we help them, we um, also create new initiatives like centralized production. Um, like I'm, I'm currently in the background, you can see a, one of our restaurants in the city of Bern. In Bern, we have over 20 operations that now don't produce locally fresh, we produce centrally and deliver it. So we can cut cost and still provide our customers that need um, food and beverage for their staff members that we can provide that. Or we initiated a web shop so they can order food in advance and make sure that they have their meals when they need it at their working place. And then of course, the second R is resilience. I mean, everybody has to, um, uh, do cash management, make sure that you plan your scenarios. And if there is one thing I remember from my, um, from Stu Gilson, my, my accounting professor, um, he always had one final slide at the end and it said in large letters, don't run out of cash. And think now in this situation, I really remember um, uh, these slides and we really make sure we don't run out of cash. I think that's very vital for not only established old companies like we are, but also for a lot of startups um, that face the difficult times now. Um, but after navigating the storm, what we're already working actually now on is, is how do we get out of this, out of the storm? How do we get back to business? Um, we have initiated a task force uh, where we try to get team together from all different um, parts of the company and um, how to prepare um, our operations to open again, how to um, put all these safety measures in, all the regulations in that have changed in the meantime, and also activate our staff members that are currently at home uh, without any work. How do we prepare them? So once we open, we don't only have costs, but we also generate revenue. So profitability is a very important element in, in all operations um, before we actually open again. And then um, while we are thinking about how we open, it's also the, the, the force R is basically the reimagination. Um, what's the next or the new normal gonna look like? Um, what are the changes? How is the business gonna change? What do our customers and guests need? And um, trying to already now implement, as I mentioned, the web shop was one thing, um, central production, another possibility. We'll see if these new ideas um, will also work after um, COVID-19 and in the new or the next normal. Um, and then of course, uh, the last R is basically the reform. How does the industry shift? How does regulation shift um, after the whole ramp up, after coming out of the storm? And do we have to adjust um, our business model? Um, uh, Many companies have to do that. Um, does the business model still work, which we had in the past, or actually um, does it change because we don't make that revenue anymore? We did in the old days. And how can we adjust that so it still is a viable, a viable business at the end? Now, um, personally, uh, I've been working from home for the last, I don't know, three, four weeks. Um, we have increased... Uh, the amount of communication, the rhythm of meetings uh, with my team. At the beginning of the crisis, we had every second day, we had our update 
and then twice a week. Now we're actually at a stage where we can do it once a week, uh, where my team, so people that are in charge of the business in Austria, Germany, or Switzerland, um, with controlling and food and beverage innovation, um, we talk to each other, see what, what are the issues, where do we have to inform people to make sure that we can move, move forward. Um, and then, of course, we think about what's the, what's the new luxury? What are the, the, the new things that are going to shape our industry? What are the things that people will look for? And just looking at myself and, and seeing all my colleagues now, um, uh, we are all working from a different location. This remote, working remotely um, is something people get used to. They realize it really does work. Um, they do more online shopping. It also works. They get used to that. Um, but they will also look for security. Hygiene is an important thing. I think that will disappear straight away. You know, when you go out again, use public transportation, come into a hotel, come into a restaurant, um, you will want to be safe. You want to make sure everything is clean. Um, and you also have gained control over your time by working from home. I think that's also something that will change our society um, that um, getting more control, being more independent um, than before, that, that's something that um, has an influence on our business and many other businesses too. When it comes to food and beverage, of course, we see a lot of um, focus more on fresh, on local, on healthy food, um, something that hasn't, that hasn't is new now, but it's going to be reinforced um, with this crisis going on. And then another two um, points we carefully look at is also price points. We believe it's going to um, polarize more into low end and high end. And uh, all the products we have in, in somewhere in the middle, we'll have to make sure we, we tailor them either to a lower end or to a higher end of, uh, of the market. And then last point probably is also um, there is going to be a consolidation. You know, some will not make it. It's, it's a very difficult time and there are going to be opportunities for the companies that, that are healthy, that are well prepared, um, and they will be able to take over, do an acquisition, uh, save jobs by doing that too. That's important. Um, and I think that is something um, we look forward. So people will always be hungry and I hope uh, that helps our, in, in our business that people will always like to come back to a restaurant to see each other again face-to-face, um, -face, not only remotely. Um, and I think that's also going to be part of luxury, new luxury, having time, having the chance to see each other, having um, the possibility to really enjoy something after having had um, many weeks of being sort of I, I'm isolated um, in their home office. So these are a few thoughts, Michelle. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, one statement uh, stayed with me especially how not to run out of cash. I think this is something which is important for, for many people. It's easily, uh, it's easily said, but what would your recommendation be, let's say for a smaller business, for a startup, what can you do in this situation to not run out of cash? Well, I think it's very important that you, you plan um, far ahead in, in scenarios. What's the best case? What's the middle case? What's the worst case? And start to adjust immediately how can you lower your costs what is not needed and it might be also small details um you know i i go through our office um, here in switzerland and say do we need this magazine do we need this newspaper is this necessary is that necessary can we stop that can we reduce it um it might be a lot of small things that help at the end get things together and then of course um uh always a question if you need financial aid um where do you get it? Do you really want to get financial aid? It's not money that, you, that is going to be given to you for free. You will have to pay that back at some point. So I think it's also very important to think about, are you going to manage to get through the crisis with this financial help? Or is that just going to make you crash later on? And um, so to prevent from crashing, um, clearly lower costs and see if you have to adjust your business model. I think this is also a time where you, you um, have, I think, a lot more time to think about your business. You don't have to run around. I, I can switch from one meeting to the next meeting with uh, pressing one button on the computer. 
um, saves me a lot of time. And these times are important to think about the business model. You have to adjust it. Um, because if you just keep your business model the way it is, and you realize this is not going to, it's not sustainable, you will definitely run out of cash. And that's, that's the end of any, any business. So it's really this idea also of every little helps. I think this was uh, in the 80s, uh, a slogan of Tesco in the UK. So it's really about every little helps. And the other thing, which I think is very interesting is you were speaking about the short time uh, work programs that your, uh, your uh, people of SV Group grow through. So what kind of knowledge is being acquired here? What, 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 what new tasks are being learned? What is the focus? Well, one of, our, one of our first challenges we actually had when we decided we're going to go into this program and, and, and uh, do this short time working program with our people is how do we communicate? I mean, we have um, over 7,000 staff members and most of them are people in the restaurant, in the hotels. Um, they don't sit in front of a computer. They don't have an email address, which we can just contact them. So how do you communicate with a team that is not connected? Um, how do we do that? The first thing was, okay, we have got WhatsApp groups and it's just going to go from the team leader to the next leader to the next leader. And so we communicate until we realize we have to set up um, quickly a communication channel to actually talk to our staff members directly. And uh, so that's something that came up very quickly and had to be solved very quickly. Uh, luckily, it works really well. And we, we stay in touch with our people that are in this um, short uh, time program and um, and uh, the government I must say has um, worked closely with us together also with our competitors together um, to help us make sure this program starts fast and um, is not too complicated to do the administration and that finally we also get the support the financial support through the government as promised. Mm -hmm. So uh, your business is also quite uh, relying on tourism. So how would you say tourism is going to be changing in the near future, maybe also in the longer future? And how will you be reacting to this? Um, we are actually looking towards China. We're looking towards Taiwan, South Korea. Um, how is their business going? They're a few weeks ahead. And it's, it's, it's uh, really worth looking um, towards Asia and seeing how how does the business come back there? Um, how do they cope with it? I think we can learn a lot from, from our Asian friends on how they go about. And since we have such a, a, a globalized world and we're so well connected, it's a, I think that's a big difference to a crisis uh, that are 100 years ago where, or, or 50, 60, 70 years ago where you didn't have this, this type of communication. So what I see is um, when I look at to Shanghai, for example, um, Restaurant business comes back, hotel business comes back um, somewhere um, 10, 30% less than before. Um, it might take much more time until travelers from abroad come into our country. I believe tourism is, I mean, in this country, in Switzerland, will mainly focus on tourism within the country. Swiss people not traveling abroad, making, taking holidays, booking something within Switzerland, um, and then after the, in the second year, um, I will, I believe many more people will start to travel internationally. Also, business-wise, business travelers, um, uh, they will for sure use the remote technology they had got used to now and fly far less. And we see in our studies that we look at um, that mainly younger people um, will start to travel first and travel rather close, let's say, in Europeans traveling more in Europe and, uh, and then later on actually going further abroad. And which steps are you taking to adapt to these new tendencies? Well, we, will, we definitely have to shift our marketing, the communication we do um, in the hotel business to make sure that we actually can, can reach these customers. Um, in, the host, in the hotel business, it's so that you know your clients really well. They're all registered at some point, you can reach them. It's now an opportunity to make interesting offers. And it's not just about um, giving them a, a discount and making sure that they come at a, um, for, for less money, but actually figuring out what's really what they need. And when you figure that out, 
you can you can target them with this special offer or this package what's really need I, I it reminds me of a of car companies you know there was crisis and car companies started to give rebates but there was one car company that didn't give any single rebate at all but they just said if you buy a car and you um, lose your job and you won't be able to pay your pay your monthly your monthly lease we'll help you out so they actually figured out what the customer really needs and i think that's also important in, their, in the hotel business we say what does the customer really want and look for and um instead of just giving discounts and rebates. And in the restaurant business, it's, um, it's a bit more challenging because often we don't know yet our guests as well. We don't have an email address. We're not so good in communicating directly with our restaurant guests. There it's much more about communication through social media, through other channels um, to, to get them back and make them feel comfortable, make them feel safe uh, when they come uh, back to the restaurant. So has your communication specifically in social media has this uh, has this being enlarged? Yeah, we actually have uh, started straight away on the, on um, a new campaign. Um, and it's in, it's in German, but it's something like uh, "We are here for you. We are, we care about you," and um, we use a lot of different um, media channels actually to target our guests, target different groups, target our clients. Um, to make sure that uh, we stay in touch with them and we can show them what we're doing and, and get them back into, into our operations. You were speaking before about the youngest generation of travelers, let's say this, the sales generation probably. So how would you say the sales generation, which is also a generation one says of entrepreneurs, we were speaking about people taking responsibility for, for what they're doing, having more control over their time. How is their, uh, are their travel habits different well, I think they um, often they are more willing to to uh, to adopt faster to a new situation. Um, they might also say, "Look, I'm I'm less a risk factor. I mean, I mean, uh, I'm younger. I might not be as affected from the virus as others might be." Um, they're willing to try things and uh, and move move sooner into into back into hotels and and, and, and travel abroad. Um, it's, it's a clientele group we especially have in our hotels during the weekends. During the week, we have a lot of business, business people. And um, it's now actually, we now actually have to see how we can move to get younger business people to also use our hotels. Currently, hotel rooms are also used as home offices, um, but that, of course, doesn't fill the whole hotel. Thank you so much, uh, Patrick, for this insight. I would also like to add that for the Q&A at the very end, uh, and this is an address to our participants, to our audience, please ask your questions uh, via the chat. Let us know who shall answer the question and also keep your question uh, as simple as possible. We'll get to that in the very end. Uh, so a big thank you again to, to Patrick. That's really very interesting to hear about the challenges you have in the gastronomy business. And our next panelist who I would like to speak with is Deandra, Deandra Donnecker of Friesebach Auctions. Uh, you are one of the youngest managing directors of an auction house and have, this has been announced, I think, just a little bit over a year ago. You're based in Berlin in the beautiful Villa Friesebach. Uh, so the art business, of course, is also a business which is specifically affected from the current situation. And at the same time, we all see how the art business is now turning online, specifically with new online gallery platforms. So what are your predictions and what are you working on as an auction house? What is your situation? Yes, hello. Thank you very much for having me. And I'm so happy that there are platforms like this very much needed. Um, so Giesebach is founded in 1986 and we are, um, which is of course a huge difference to your business, Patrick, only 50 employees. Um, and we have this one main building here in Berlin and then of course some offices in Zurich and New York and so on, but um, we are quite small. And um, so how do we cope with the situation? I mean, it's um, a huge challenge, of course, and um, I think the most important for us is to be in strong communication with our partners. And um, this means two types of clients because we have the ones 
who um, consign art to our auctions, which are um, taking place twice a year. And then, of course, the ones who we want to buy when the sale happens. And, of course, these um, groups are not to be divided, uh, but um, it's a different way of contacting them and to being in a dialogue constantly all over the year. And um, what we see right now is that there is a huge insecurity that every one of us can understand. And as buying art is something that is personal and emotional, psychological, in a way, um, as a motor to buy art, um, it is not easy to have this one idea that would solve this problem, so to speak, because you always have to handle different types of um, clients and humans you work with. Um, in terms of acquisitions, we would normally now travel the world or travel the country to get the best art for the German market. And of course, we cannot. So we cannot meet clients. We cannot meet in person. The Zoom telephone conference is not a really good tool for um, um, discussing if you want to consign a work of art or not. And um, since the TFAF was closed in March, uh, I think it was March 11th, um, we really could feel that there was no business coming in anymore because everyone was hesitate. Um, is it the right time to sell art? Right now we can feel that there is a little bit of a um, relaxation. Um, there is the need to sell for some clients, of course. And um, I think because you are in this lockdown, you start to think about your passion and your hobbies. So um, where Patrick has the need of being fed and to eat and to enjoy that as a cultural habit as well, um, we have clients who have this hard passionate, I don't know, um, motivation. And um, this gets, um, you can feel that it, I don't know what you will later say with your gallery, but I think it comes back in a way. So um, this is something that makes me a little bit more optimistic. And of course, as being a German auction house and not my dear colleagues at Sotheby's and Christie's, we do not talk about um, um, like the super rich um, person living in three different um, countries and owning uh, ships and so on. We have like a more classic conservative type of a buyer and they are all coping with the situation quite good. So the German government does a great job. We have now this um, relaxation in Germany with some galleries getting open again and um, this helps, I hope. Nevertheless, we did um, postpone our auctions. Normally the sales date is early June and we decided to step four weeks um, on. So now it's July, um, early July, and we hope that we can make an auction that means with a sales room. Of course, we have all the options doing a sale online and we have the classical ways to bid via telephone or written bids. But the sales room, again, has this um, emotional factor that is not to be underestimated. Of course, the most important bits never, not never, but hardly come from the sales room. Um, but it has to do something with atmosphere and, um, um, again, this personal um, thing I mentioned before. So... Um, we do rethink our online presentation in terms of how many um, illustrations do we put online, how do we make um, the artwork, uh, artwork accessible um, via virtual reality or some um, videos showing the whole sculpture, but um, it is about this very personal encounter all the time. Um, so, yes, we work at Full Blast towards online, but with some limitations, as I feel, just due to the um, core topic we have. Um, what we try to do when we talk about more communication is to get closer to our clients, the one we know. Of course, we can talk to them on the phone, etc. but there are many who we don't know, and we try to reach them via our website, of course. 
but um, via Instagram as a super democratic tool and accessible all the time as well. So we started to produce little expert videos introducing the colleagues we have because every colleague is of course um, a diamond with the knowledge he or she has and making them talk in public um, and delivering our content we have in here behind the closed walls. And um, another thing is that, um, of course, we had a conversation with all our competitors on the German market. And what was really nice is that you have mentioned um, as well, even if it's a very difficult situation, it in a way helps to start talking um, with your competitors as well um, in a very nice way of solidarity. And we all um, found the conclusion that it is major important to do the sales this year because, of course, we thought about postponing it in the autumn time. Um, but it would mean that we do not trust into our market and that we don't trust into our clients. And of course, we have um, as an auction house um, the responsibility towards the people who want to sell. So we cannot just um, um, push it into a later um, point of time. And I think um, it's, it's a very important, or I believe it's a very important domino effect when you say, I trust, and I think we can make this, then it helps the gallery will profit from this, other auction houses and everyone um, being part in the art market. Um, for myself, I have to say that, yes, I have so many friends working remotely. Um, I myself, I can hardly do it because of course, or I could do it, but um, for my colleagues, spoken for my colleagues, they cannot because we are working in front of the originals and we have to um, do all the cataloging, taking the photos, etc. So there are many, many colleagues who just cannot work from home. And we now have um, a system which is um, like alternately working so everyone is here but every day another colleague and um, this means that we lost important time of course um, this is another reason for postponing and um, we do all our communication um, with telephone conferences and video talks like zoom which is very important because i think as a managing director or being in this position it is a really really important factor to have the motivation quite high and to make everyone um, being part of that journey and um, because it's so new to everyone and the whole world community is shaking in the same way like you do in your private life it has this um, very nice way of supporting each other by just talking and maybe even saying wow i had a really difficult night or i didn't sleep at all because i was um, full of um, sorrows and um, and frightened or whatever i think it's the time to show emotions which maybe is important for all the three of us that you are always again authentic um, with the way you talk um, to clients and partners and um, colleagues and um, yeah, so to me, the most vulnerable point in this time is that I cannot meet anyone that nobody wants to meet yet, his or her home. And I'm really like locked in and I have to try to hold um, um, the discussion and the talk alive. But um, my normal life um, is in a complete turn turnover. Do you say that? So normally I wouldn't sit here, I'd be in Vienna and I'm not and I always look into my calendar and it's like okay if I would I but I'm not um, and um, it's like a different time writing. So um, regarding our practical strategy, strategies and um, what is urgent to us now I think of course very important and very um, clear is always cost reduction. So um, we are a very lean organization. There is not so much we can do about the people working here because they are all experts on a field and this would mean to 
to tear us apart uh, apart but what we can do is something like where do we do our catalog production um, who does all the illustrations online etc so cost reduction is a point then um, Griesebach was always very classical when it came to selling art online um, we just didn't do it um, because the um, owner and founder of Griesebach was always um, thinking that um, art is so important um, and has so much meaning that we need to see it in the original and that nothing else can translate it or um, transfer it. And this is something that uh, I wanted to change as soon as I started here, not because I think that it's less important to talk in front of the artwork, but I think it's a more democratic, easy way to get in contact. And um, there is some kind of a, um, limitation when we talk about value um, or estimates. So I think it's difficult to sell art beyond 10,000 euros in Germany online. So as of course, then it's important to have other options, personal ones for the more um, higher value works. Um, then we have um, interestingly enough and maybe something to discuss um, a great um, reaction on private sales. So people being afraid of selling um, art in auctions, very transparent both ways, but of course you can look up what result um, is made in an auction. And so there are many more who want to sell directly in a private sale and we can offer that with a department existing. Um, then of course we have new communication strategies. We um, we will um, introduce some kind of a journal, which is not super new, but um, for us, it's, it's a new way to start talking to people in a very customized way. So um, not only a newsletter, and then we will start producing a podcast because talking about art in the global world is huge, but for Germany, it's still in the beginning. And um, this is something we plan. Um, and I think the Andrew, which I think is quite interesting uh, that you said, so do I understand correctly that digital transformation is something that is happening on one hand, but through the current situation, there has not been a lot of change in the idea of digital transformation, the idea that everything can go online, but you said the value of trust you think is extremely important. I think this is important. This is very interesting that trust is something that becomes uh, more important now. Yes, and it's interesting because I think the parallel to Patrick's business is people want to have healthy food, they want to have regional food, they want to know where it comes from, etc. They want to know what the food is they have in their mouth. And for us, it's the same in a way. They want to know whom they're talking to. So our personal um, um, connection is super important and they want to trust that I sell the best work I can offer to them and that if I don't think that it fits or makes sense to the person interested and in that I say this very frankly. So um, I think if Corona or this whole situation, which um, is difficult and uh, incredibly, but um, when it has something positive, then it is that it would help or could help to think about what is important where do I belong to, with which content do I want to fill my time, who do I want to meet, what do I want to collect, do I really need 10 different artists or is it just this, should I do this stock cleaning as a private person as well. And I think if Corona means concentration, then this is a good part of this in Corona, but um, maybe it's very optimistic, but I feel like there is a positive um, concentration. How would you say the business, the art business specifically, will be affected in the future? Is it going to bounce back? How long is it going to bounce back? Is it going to be changed forever? Is it a different kind of art that people are looking for? Is there a different rhythm in buying and selling art? Um, yes, I think it will have a major influence on the art market. I think less art fairs, less galleries, less events, less travel, um, more focus, more content, um, more seriousness. 
And then I think it has a very nice philosophical turn in a way, um, or I don't know if I say it precisely, but like art belongs to everyone and it's so nourishing at the time right now when you look how all the galleries present their talks, how many people listening to artists, whether it's a musician or a dancer or a painter, I don't want to have this term of art too narrow. Um, it's so important and it helps so many people living in their apartment. And I think this will maybe have an influence that has an impact on the future. But because I think um, the human being in the end is not a sheep, but a wolf, it will just take some time and, and it will get back in some ways that it again is um, full of like time pressure. And of course, everyone will do the long distance flights again as soon as possible. But maybe like this 10% where you have the possibility to decide, do I do this or do I go this way? This will hopefully have an influence in a positive way. So one very pragmatic, uh, simple question is uh, nearly anecdotal. Which art sells best at the moment, would you say? What, what what is the art that people want at the moment when they buy something? Mm, so I think um, um, the better, which means quality, rarity, name of the artist, the better the art is, the better it sells. And I wouldn't be surprised if you have a great result for a um, blue ship work that is selling very good if now or in, uh, in one year. Um, but I think this is maybe something we have to think about more. What we offer is always in between 10 to 100,000 euro. And it's sometimes what is like a mediocre quality from one artist. And I don't think that this is easy because um, it's like an artwork that is okay, but maybe not always the best of the best. And um, this is something that we have to think about. Yes. Yeah. No, th thank you so much, Deandre. It's super interesting. Thank you very much. And I would like to encourage our audience to send us questions for Deandra, for Patrick, and for Victor, which we will be answering at the very end of this session. Please send it over chat and we will answer them. So our next speaker, Victor Giesler uh, from Zurich founder of the My36 Gallery. Victor, thank you for joining us. You have been in the gallery business for 30 years now. So is this your worst crisis yet? Hello to everybody. Thank you, Michelle, for having me talking here. And uh, as the last one, it's a little bit, uh, of course, difficult to sum, to sum up everything. Most of the things which um, Patrick and Deandra said very much applied to us. We are a small company, May 36, for 30 years is in Zurich based in a townhouse. We have three floors, we host three exhibition. Let's say every six and eight weeks we change. We have 10 people, we work in Asia with an Asian representative and we have a director for Latin America. And we are from the art fairs which Diandra explained we are globally. Let's say I started the, the year in Arco Madrid, the last, the last fair I was there, which went through, Tefaf as we heard closed. And normally I would have been in Milano, I would have been in Hong Kong. I should go to Basel, which has been postponed and then it continues with London, Paris, Shanghai and uh, Miami. As we all heard, everything is closed. I never had that. I started the gallery in 87, 88 in a financial crisis. Everybody was asking why a gallery, what is this? I went and stayed through as a young gallerist in 91. This was the Gulf War crisis, mm -hmm. which is now interesting if we look at Art Basel. In those days, Art Basel was just about to get an international audience in 91. This fair at that time, became a local fair. We had almost no American people because the American people were feeling unsecure. They didn't want to travel to Switzerland because of the Gulf War. 
And then we had the financial crisis in 2007 and 8, where to answer the question what the art market does, we lost probably 30 to 35% turnover in total. But as Deandra said, with the metaphor for the wolf, recovered very, very quickly. The one we have now, as we all heard, is affecting the trust. The virus, we don't see. If we would see it, that everybody has a right hand and everybody would see, oh, this person has a virus, it would be very bad for that person, but of the people would adjust to that. Today, the world cannot. It's going around, it's harming everything. So we are all sitting at home and looking at the, the current situation for the gallery, as Patrick described, I have the gallery in Switzerland, so luckily I have the possibility to put my people on short term, which I did. As Patrick does, I try to tell them what is work we haven't done in the gallery. So. We are fixing up certain things which we should have done for a while. We have the help from the government in terms of going through money which we need, which the banks gives us, which I'm completely in the same thinking as Patrick. You only should take it if you really, really, really see the possibility in short term also to get it paid back. The nice thing as also Deandra was saying, everybody's in the same boat. So I was asking my landlord, I was saying, hey, this is not going to work. I have three exhibitions right now. I had to close. Nobody's coming. What shall we do? So the landlord said, hey, I give you the rent for half for two months. And from there on, we will see. So that was a very nice gesture, which happens here. I know in other areas, it might not happen but maybe it also has to do with me being as a, as a small fighter, 30 years around and belonging to, let's say, the backbones of the Swiss art scene and belong to the 200 most important contemporary galleries in the globe. Being around, my day-to-day -day after that was talking to the artists. Can you imagine? They are in the studio. They don't know what's going on. They don't know that any art fair might happen, doesn't happen. Then, like all of us, we have to talk to the clients. We know them. So what I did is personal email. I explained the situation, how I see it, contacted my best clients with a personal email. I was not trying to sell, just trying to say, hey, how are you? This is going on. This is what we're trying to do. Then we're trying to be with the curators more or less in the conversation and the museum people. Everything is closed. The only thing which is working is probably the artist studio at the time. Most of these people, they have to go to the studio if they can and they work. So just to say my biggest hope out there is that great art comes out of that decade as it was in the 20s. If you remember the roaring 20s, it was very difficult, but great art came out of that. So I'm very positive of that things. Mm -hmm. And in terms of mm -hmm. what we do now, my Asian representative had a great idea. She was saying, okay, we have all this artwork already in Hong Kong. Don't forget, Hong Kong was canceled. The Art Basel did the online thing, which we heard. She asked me if she could rent a place in Taipei with a shipper to put the work which we had already in Asia in the space and receive people by appointment in Taiwan. The people can move, they have masks, but by appointment it's possible. So I said, it's a great idea. So we painted the space, we organized the light, we get ourselves a table and a couple of chairs and made an exhibition entitled Kairos with some of the artists, two of them are behind Deandra, one is the sculptor by Balkan Hall, and one is the painter, Magnus Plessen. So those artists are hanging in Taipei in an exhibition. It's working, we are getting press. The people are excited, something is happening. And we are going to give a talk 
this month with a professor in photography because we have one of the major photographers, Thomas Ruff, in that section, who has scheduled an exhibition in Taiwan, postponed, of course, due to the situation. And in the end, we will have Thomas Ruff being online so people can ask questions. Right. So that's a way to operate in this situation. The, the rest is trying to get the platform like Deandre was saying. We're just working now, how can we use online, the virtual space in the future to make it dynamic, have a great atmosphere, have the content and have it in-house similar, let's say you have offline where you can visit us and you have online like today, we have to come to you because you cannot visit us. So we're trying to think what would be for us the best way of using that tool. It's like Deandre was saying, it's very, very difficult to sell something online unless it's something people were looking for, somebody saw it, the price is correct, he knows exactly what it is, he buys it. If it's something high quality, very, very serious, very, very good, you're probably not even going to offer it online. If it's something mediocre, but very, very looked after, you may have today an audience who has a chance to buy it because before Corona, this work would not even be on the market. It's been sold. How, what, what is the urgent thing for us now? It's the same thing, trying to stay cash. The second thing is connect ourselves with the people, reduce the costs. I mentioned we have the people on short term. As Patrick is saying of the, on the question for the young startup, it's exactly what you have to do. I went through a lot of expenses and I was asking myself, do we really have to do this? Is there another way we can do it? I went into the warehouse recently, two warehouses full of things. I went through and asked my guy, what do we do here? Why do we need that? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is one way right now to navigate through in terms of right now. But there's also a, a silver line on the horizon. We can open the gallery soon. I'm sure that within two weeks, we can go back to operation. I see that by the 15th of May, I will be able to set up the two, the two new exhibitions which I had to postpone due to the coronavirus. I will do online a situation, I will create an online situation where our people from Zurich who could visit us book 45 minutes. They go to the townhouse, up to five people. I got masks. So if you come to the townhouse, you can ask for a mask. People can go around. My people are there. I'm just trying to, 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 to create a trustful, safe situation. And hopefully we all can get the people a little bit excited, a little bit out of that situation, which we're all in. And it will get back. The curiosity will get back. The younger people probably are first out there. I can see that. I can also see the situation that all the people might have difficulties to travel, even in Switzerland, that it will take my energy to get these old clients on the phone, ask them to come by, look what we have. And of course, it will be a terrific situation like you would have seen your best friend for 10 years not, and now you see him. It's, it's, it's a new situation. We also talked about the tools in the future. I'm not so sure that the art fairs can stay. Maybe that is a topic separate because there were too many, as I described and as Deandra described, we would be right away on, the, on, on planes. I would not be sitting here. I would be somewhere having to see this person, that person doing a fair, organizing an exhibition, whatever. This will calm down. This will go down. Maybe, Victor, just one question uh, I'm very curious about. Your son has just curated his, post, his first show at your gallery, 
And at the same time, he is also uh, a creative in the digital world. So he comes very much from the virtual, from the online business. And you have been also working together with him. So what is the best advice he, as a set generation, gave you in terms of the digital transformation of your gallery? Reach, reach, the content. I already, you know, he made me a whole menu of how we can use social media. The one we heard is the immediate thing. So the gallerist, I talked how I founded the gallery, how I came to where I am now. So I spoke about that live. My daughter filmed it. It went on Instagram. We got almost 3,000 likes there which is for me as a small gallery, pretty okay. The same thing we do with the, our people. We ask them, for instance, what's a piece you love in the gallery? So they, po they post it. Or I was on a walk. I saw a fantastic field of rasp. I remembered a work Christoph Rüttemann, a famous Swiss artist did in 88. I have that piece. He walks through this field, throws a camera up, many, many times and the camera makes the random photographs and then he generated the piece and the piece is called Ya detto che giallo non è bello. Who says that yellow is not nice? So we post and also there we got even people from Canada saying, I remember that work. So you have a connection again. So he tries to tell me active a lot, being honest, direct, Speaking about my passion, the gallery's passion, it's basically what I'm trying to do offline. When you come to visit me, you see great work. We have time for you. We are a small boutique. We take you through an interesting tour in three areas of the gallery. My son has now done 36.1, which is exactly a platform to introduce new art, new things. So we have a photographer doing something on, on borders. Huh? At the end, and I would just like uh, one or two more questions. Yes. Uh, uh, there's one question which actually came in online for you, Victor, yes. from Nico. And the question is, a French survey reveals that one third of French galleries could shut down before end of 2020 due to the coronavirus impact. What about the impact in Switzerland? Well, probably meaning Swiss, the Swiss art world, Swiss galleries. How do you see... I wouldn't say a third. I, I, I can see that some of my colleagues might not have the engagement, the will, or the finances to go through that. But I have to say the Swiss government helps through the roughest time right now. Everything which is coming in September to December is, a different, is on a different sheet of paper, if you can navigate on that. And that is, like Patrick was saying, you know, you you got to be like water. You have to adjust. Water goes the way it wants to go. You have to analyze. You have to see what's going to happen. You have to think about the sustainability. What is the next thing? How can you connect to the people? If you have loyal people, they're coming. Maybe one, one, also one statement, which would be interesting, maybe also from you, Deandra, and from Victor, uh, you said, what is the change going to be with art fairs? What will be happening to art fairs? We had such a huge explosion of art fairs in the past 20 years. What is the tendency here? What do you see the future of the art fair world? Right now, everybody maybe has realized or heard that Basel world, the famous watch world, is probably going to be not anymore happening since the big companies left. I don't know what really happened there, but they left. So they're going independent. If the biggest galleries we have in our industry would say we don't need those fairs anymore, it's going to be the same thing. So it is totally fragile. A fair today has to understand that what they have is the contacts to the gallerists and the contacts to the major clients on the planet. This is what they have. It's not the real estate. Before they sold us real estate, but now with all the information, 
online, digital, etc. They know exactly what are the galleries, who do we want, what artists they can bring, and who are the clients. Because all those VIPs, etc. can you imagine the, the amount of information they have? The whole art fair system in the sense that there's a lot of knowledge comprised yes. in the art fairs and specifically, totally. of course, the oldest and best art fairs. Yeah. Well, they would... I'm sorry, we just don't, we were nearly at the end. Maybe just one more quote also from Deandra concerning the art fair. I just wanted um, to say that maybe because there are so many um, art fairs, that it would help um, to have this reduction because they were missing the contact, the vetting, um, the quality was not always um, very good. So I think this um, very event character of being an event only um, will be um, overthink, overthought. Overthought is the word. And it's nice, I guess. Well, I think quality will stay always. Yeah. Yes. The and quality. art which has something to say is now the thing, the content as you were saying. Mm -hmm. Very, very strong. And, and quality will stay, that, that's a very nice uh, end statement. I would just like to have a few last words. Well, first of all, thank you so much, all three of you. It was super interesting, really great. And I look forward also to continue these kind of webinars, which are very urgent at the moment. Some last words on upcoming activities. The LBG, the Luxury Venture Group Bootcamp for Startups takes place from 18 to 20 September this year in Geneva. There will be the Luxury Venture Conference, which is a new conference 2021. And next year, Luxury Venture Group will launch its accelerator program where startups can apply, get funding, and are invited to Switzerland for three months. Please check uh, the website of Luxury Venture Group for this. Also check their social media. And again, thanks to all the panelists. And I look forward to many more discussions. Thank and you. And thank you for our uh, thank you for our audience. Also, thank you. Thank Just you very much for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.